Hello. I want to talk about two of my favorite topics, two of my favorite topics. Um, try not to go off on too many tangents or explain too many words. Uh, you may have noticed that I use a lot of big specific words and I don't use them to brag or to alienate. Um, they're just kind of how I talk because I'm in love with learning about words and then using those words correctly. So what I want to do is talk about two of my huge interests. One is the Word of God and really understanding it, applying it to my life and letting it change me. The other one is unknown animals, cryptozoology. Now to be a believer who is interested in cryptozoology involves taking a look at your own, this is a bit, one of those terms I warned you about, epistemological self-consciousness. Epistemal Epistemological self-consciousness is a term that describes there being no difference between what you believe and understanding what you believe and how you act. So becoming a believer means fully understanding what that means and letting that affect all the ways you think and behave and not having any sections of your life where you're like, God doesn't care about this. God doesn't, God doesn't care how I act at work. God doesn't care how I act at the game. Doesn't care, doesn't, God doesn't care about my political thoughts. Rather, we should be allowing the thoughts of God to be permeating and transforming every area of our lives proactively. So, for many people, any interest in unknown animals involves basing that on evolutionism. The idea that in a godless universe, cells mutate to become bigger, better adaptive life forms. As a believer, I believe in creation as described in the Bible. Now, to be intellectually fair, you can make two interpretations when it says in seven days God created the heavens and the earth. One is that he snaps his fingers, he speaks forth his words, and it suddenly happens, which is a legitimate interpretation. The other one is that he uses a specific method he doesn't tell us about. Throughout the Bible, God does things and doesn't tell us all the details because he doesn't have to. The Bible is meant to be a book about God. And so it touches on topics like science, astronomy, farming, psychology, and gives truth, but isn't meant to be a textbook on those things. It does not mean it's contradictory with textbooks of anything, because science, on its purest form, is something that reveals God, doesn't conceal God. So I believe as a believer, I can believe in microevolution, but not macroevolution, you see? Microevolution is, within one species, you adapting to things. That is, people becoming taller, people becoming darker or lighter, smaller, bigger, more insulated, better able to absorb sunlight, worse able to absorb sunlight, within the context of one species, with mutation, but not the belief that, say, gorillas became people. Now, that's crucial because many of the things in cryptozoology rely on the principle of evolution. Now what I want to do, if I want to be a biblical person who is also interested in the idea of unknown animals, I have to compare that to what the Word of God says, both about science in general and about animal behavior in specific. And then parts of science that exist in a freestanding fashion don't contradict the Word of God. So, what do I like about cryptozoology? I like that it reminds us that science doesn't know everything, that there's things that God has made that we haven't seen, we haven't discovered, that it's out there, that I think it's arrogant when scientists say, because we haven't discovered evidence of this creature, we have to discount the reports of local people. The problem is we're talking about low population areas where people subsist in hunting and fishing, we actually are talking about people who make their livelihood on correct identification of animals. That's really important. I would never tell a hunter, a fisherman, or a tracker that because you don't have a PhD in applied sciences, that your impression that that was or was not a bear is invalid. That's foolish. That's absolutely foolish. That hunter, if they're a lifetime person who is making a living, living or dying, um, on the proper identification of animal sign and animal appearance, 
could be wrong or it could be wrong because a scientist doesn't agree is dumb. It's really dumb. We should validate the knowledge of people that live in there as much as we do the knowledge of a scientist who's never been there. They should be complementary pieces of data that we look at side by side. We should not, should not reject either one. What I dislike about cryptozoology is so often it has a anti-God perspective, or rather just a godless universe perspective. I will be using occasionally references from the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is not in the canon of scripture, but it sits in a very unique category. And I specify that by saying, of all the books that are in the Apocrypha, that is, books that had been parts of collections of scripture that did not make it into the present canon of scripture, it is the one that is quoted. It is quoted in the Word of God, shining like stars in their generation, saying that those that made the canon of scripture do not see it as a completely destructive or unnecessary book. So, but what is God in relation to his creation? He's the key. He's the one that loves us. He's also, because I mean, that's the purpose of creation, to create a setting for the gospel to play out naturally with a free will involved. Okay? That's what the creation is for. That's what this planet is for. Now, we say that and we compare that to, there are other things that don't make perfect sense in that context. That is, there's ways in which creation shows God as an artist who was doing things for creative drives, for as, if I can speak to all the artists here, people that consider themselves born artists, genetically formed artists, someone who had no choice in the matter, someone who has creative urges that have to be expressed, to write a song, to make a film, to compose a dance, to write a rap, to paint a picture, something germinates in a creative womb inside your soul, inside your spirit, and it's going to, of its own accord, push forward to existence. I believe those urges, the ones that do not lead to sin, are a reflection of something inside of God himself. God the Creator loves creating, loves making, receives a joy like a painter painting something, so that all of our creativity is an imitation of his, and his is the only truly original creativity. So, we have certain things that evolutionists would determine to be flukes, dead ends, and I would determine to be a stimulating project in God's creation art studio. The platypus. The platypus makes no sense other than God said, you know what? I want to see what happens if I put together a mammal, an egg layer. I want to put some poison spurs on there. What was God thinking? And yet this is this is the context here. The dragonfly is the only creature with a virtually 100% kill rate in its hunting strategy. It can move in six, uh, six directions in space. It has detached eyes that can see more than any other creature. Perfect. And why? It doesn't exist in a lineage of similar, similar creatures other than the big thing that preceded it. It exists because God wanted to. It exists because God wanted to make this thing that was an expression of his creativity. A statement that he is the most unique think thinker, the most unique creative mind in the universe. Finally, the pigeon. You know how the pigeon can navigate places? It has a piece of organic metal in its head that's magnetic, enabling it, it to sense the Earth's magnetic field and navigate like a GPS in its head. I don't believe from... Okay, this is what I think. I think if you were forced to look at evolution and creationism, they both take faith to believe in. I know, I have reasons that I'll share in another video why I absolutely firmly believe in Jesus as the creator and as the God of the universe. But even if I did not, presented with creationism and evolutionism, I would say both take faith to believe in. The idea that any of those things that is described come from random, intelligent design, evolved behavior, takes faith to believe in. Except that of the two, one provides hope. If you had to gamble and take your chances, 
one of them provides hope. They both require faith. There is no hope for an afterlife. There is no hope of a good and loving God behind the facade of evolution. Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to uncover it, to search it out. What I'm saying is that God has created special things that science has not yet discovered. We discover new creatures all the time. Some of them big, some of them small. I'm going to introduce valid scientific perspectives from which some of these could still exist and still not be discovered. See, it's the egotism of the human mind that says, <coughs> the egotism of the human mind says, well, if science has been looking for it for 100 years, obviously it's not there. Because it's not possible anything is smart enough to evade us. Bull something. There are things with intelligence to evade us. There are things being protected by God. Things that are both physical, and then there are also things that are spiritual, that fulfill the definitions of the various cryptids we're going to look at. Hopefully change our perspective from a more biblical one related to cryptozoology and the animals related thereof. So join me in a journey as we try to uncover what the Bible would tell us about 11 or 12 different things we would call cryptids. The Yeti, Nessie, and other sea monsters, aliens, giants, vampires, and werewolves, and zombies, one category, ghosts, dragons, thunderbirds, satyrs, unicorns, and possibly teenagers. If I have blessed you, encouraged you, or equipped you in any fashion, please like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, pray more, complain less.